My name is Katrina Kibben, and Tom Bolt will be very excited to see this little mention of my actual name and not Ryan Leary. Uh, you are watching Recruiting Live. So if you've never been here before, because I know we have a few new faces in the attendee group, uh, Recruiting Live is the opposite of a webinar. We are not going to present slides. We're not going to, you know, walk through one, two, three. We're going to answer your questions about real recruiting challenges and about the new recruiting association, ATAP. So today we have two representatives of ATAP here, Derek Zeller and Ben Godkin, uh, and I want to give them a chance to introduce themselves and then we'll jump right in. Uh, one thing to mention, if you've never used GoToWebinar before, which would probably blow my mind, uh, there's a question pane and it says questions on it. So if you type your questions in there, they'll come directly to me and I'll be happy to facilitate those and make sure they get to our two uh, panelists, I guess. Um, feel free to say hi, test it out, make sure it works. Um, all right, now, meet Zeller. Zeller, tell people about you. Hi, guys. Whoops. Oh, turned off his camera. We're trying to mute because they're in the same room, so if there's any text voice, it was blame Zeller. <laughs> you muted. Zeller, you're on mute. <laughs> Click on the microphone. I'm now unmuted. So now I will say everything that you can actually hear me. Works that way. Kind of fun. Uh, Derek Zeller, ComScore, lead recruiter data uh, for data analysts, data analytics, uh, stats, programmers, all kinds of fun stuff. Been in the business 19 years. Been writing for Recruiting Daily for a little over two and a half years now, I think. Um, so if you want ever to go and Check that stuff out. I'd love it. And now I'm going to actually mute myself for the real reason so you can talk to Ben. Here we go. One second. Show your shirt. Oh, that's right. I got dressed up, guys. So I'm wearing my tuxedo <laughs> TIE fighter shirt. Very special. And we pull this out for very special occasions like this. So, Ben, up to you. Special occasions. I'm honored. Uh, such a it came so formal uh, <laughs> to this today. Uh, it's fantastic. Uh, but no, thank you, thank you, Derek. Thank you, Katrina, for uh, for having me today. Uh, my name is Ben Gotkin. I am a career recruiter, 20 plus years uh, in the recruiting world. Uh, started on the agency side, about maybe five miles east of here in Tyson's Corner, as a researcher. Uh, then went corporate. Was corporate for 18 years, including gigs at uh, BAE Systems and. Uh, MITRE Corporation, Inelsat, uh, uh, Recruiting Director at RSM, and Recruiting Director at Marriott. Uh, about four years ago, I joined Recruiting Toolbox, and that's been my paid gig for the past uh, few years. It's been uh, amazing working with people like John Vlastelika, Carmen Hudson, Matt Grove, Shannon Anderson, uh, and doing training and consulting for clients, large and small, globally. Uh, but the unpaid uh, passion of mine has been recruiter community and recruiter learning and development. And that really has kind of led to where we are here today, which we're going to get into with what ATEP is all about. Absolutely. So let's start with, you know, where the idea came from. Uh, why do you think recruiting needs an association? Well, you know, recruiting used to have an association. Uh, the Employment Management Association, EMA, was around for a number of years uh, and uh, did a lot of the functions of what you would expect a professional association to do. In uh, the mid-90s, they were acquired by, uh, I think it was mid-90s, somewhere in the 90s, they were acquired by SHRM. Uh, they were made a special interest group of SHRM. Uh, and then in the early 2000s, uh, SHRM got rid of all the special interest groups. Uh, and EMA became SMA and it became more of a focus on talent management and more of a focus on uh, recruiting as HR generalists do recruiting. Uh, so where we used to have this central resource uh, a number of years ago, 20, 15, 20 years ago, uh, is now long gone. And what's interesting is that the profession, particularly on the corporate side, has evolved uh, significantly in the past dozen, 15 years by necessity. Uh, you have uh, people who actually are making careers that are recruiting on the corporate side that where maybe HR was the ultimate path they would have to go before. You have specialties like uh, sourcing and employment branding and program management that didn't exist, hardly existed a decade ago. You have industries now like RPO that didn't exist uh, 12 to 15 years ago. Uh, so not only have we not had a central resource, central place 
that uh, has pulled where the body of knowledge is pulled together, where standards are built, it's advocating for the profession uh, that creates a central community. Um, you know, what's happened over the past 12 to 15 years has just been, it's just happened. Uh, and that now that we believe, and myself and many people believe, that there's an opportunity to, through a nonprofit, independent organization, to be that central resource, to be the place where uh, standards, educational measurements, ethics are developed, curated, uh, and uh, and promoted out within the recruiting community, uh, where uh, we can advocate uh, in terms of laws and regulations with media, with the business world in general, as to what recruiting is and what our interests are, uh, and where we can start to pull together a lot of these great communities, uh, like the one I founded here in, in DC, Recruit DC, and you know a dozen and a half other local communities around the country, and even communities around the world uh, that have almost all of them grassroots that grew because people saw the void in their own backyard when it came to networking and education and saw the need to do something uh, and to educate and, and develop uh, their own. So uh, the idea essentially came out of, uh, you know, we about five, six years ago initially, hey, you know what? We don't have a place like EMA uh, anymore, and we're doing these things locally. But we're also locally we're doing these things in a vacuum. We're all doing this our own, you know, building our own silos here. Uh, what if, if we really want to address the issues that challenge us most in recruiting? Uh, what would we need to do to do that? So, and it was about four years ago I started to chat with Jerry Crispin. Uh, it was, uh, and he agreed that, uh, yeah, you know, this is someone we should be looking at. Is he used to be involved with DMA and his involvement with other organizations somewhere over the years, uh, and uh, wrote a dozen or so page white paper around that time, kind of mapping out what this might look like. And then it was really about a couple years ago, really started to socialize this uh, with people like Derek and Steve Levy, uh, and uh, I think it was a year and a half ago, we had a call with a dozen or so uh, recruiting leaders and thought leaders, uh, influencers, uh, brought up the idea, and then it just started to build from there. Everybody we were talking about this was saying, yeah, this is a great idea. We need something like this. This is long overdue. Yeah, so, yeah, please. Um, about a year and a half ago, I, but not ever talking to Ben or Jerry about, this, about the topic, I wrote a paper basically after meeting everybody. We met in New York and Jerry and, and, and uh, I had dinner with a couple of other people and he started chatting about this article that I put on Recruiting Daily about we need an association. And Jerry's like, I've been wanting this for uh, forever. And he mentioned Ben and then Ben sent me over the white paper and I got really excited. And like Ben said, we're, we're I'm going to steal the line. I think it's a little bit more pretty, but um, I'm going to steal a line from a Pearl Jam song. It's called Whispering Through a Megaphone. Uh, we're, you know, you know we're, just, we're disassociated through, with no association, but we're all kind of saying the same thing. I mean, we have, you know, fight spam websites in, on Facebook. We have, we have, like, you know, groups on, on different levels that are getting together and ha having the same conversations all the time. Every time I go to SourceCon, it's the same conversations of, of frustration and, and how do we... How do we fix this broken this this broken wheel? And I think that's where this association comes in. That's why I've put like a, a good deal of time and effort, as has been, as is the other uh, board members that, were, that are right now at the advisory board. Um, we spent a lot of late evenings having a lot of very interesting conversations that literally went pretty long, but it had to get hammered out. And um, I'm just I can't tell you how excited I am to get this whole thing going. And really, in I'm hoping in having a, like an actual global conference in maybe two years. Uh, okay. I mean, I don't want to, I, I like, I want to make sure that we, we, we move like molasses, that we take it very slow, uh, we build upon the, the mistake, we build upon the mistakes and the, and the uh, successes, and literally have something that we could do, like a, a nice global conference, and it wouldn't, I don't think we'd, I would even want to charge except maybe like 50 bucks and people can get online, and it's just be the tribe that we are. Yeah. So that's what I decided. So we have a few questions coming in, of course. Uh, that's how Recruiting Live works. Um, Jacob Madsen's here. So glad to have you, buddy. Uh, he said, so this is a great fundamentals question. Is ATAP for recruiters in-house, or are you going more much wider with this? Who are you including? 
Yeah, a uh, great question, uh, and a lot of debate over this too. In fact, uh, we did a survey uh, not this past summer, but the summer before, and asked. Uh, yeah, I think we we had got a few hundred responses uh, about who should be who is this organization really for, and there were some uh, very uh, vocal practitioners who said, no, this should be practitioner only, but. When, you, when we look at the problems and the issues and the challenges that we face, uh, these aren't just uh, issues and challenges that practitioners alone face. Uh, and that, you know, I, I'm a strong believer that we can do a lot more together than by you know, creating more silos out there. Uh, you know, one of the points of this being a nonprofit, independent organization is that hopefully we're going to create a safe place where practitioners and non-practitioners can come together and really work through the issues together. Uh, and come up with with common solutions. So this is meant to be inclusive, uh, and you know there's going to be some rules in place. This is not a place you know necessarily where you know non practitioners should be looking. Oh, hey, great uh, sales and marketing opportunity. Yeah, I mean those that, sp that we're have sponsorship opportunities. Those that want to be a part of the conversation, want to promote what we're doing here. You know we want them to. You know we have opportunities for them to participate. But you know, anybody that really need, is going to be engaged with this should see this as an opportunity to, uh, to help address the issues that we're facing and trying to solve. And not with any bias, not with, hey, my product and my, my way is the only way. But hey, you know, what, what are the issues overall and how collectively can, can we truly address those? Everybody. Absolutely. Tom Bolt just uh, sent me a message that said, sourcers are practitioners, but different rules apply. They just have the thrill <laughs> of the chase. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, well, I mean, there's so many different flavors and varieties, and I mean, heck, you know, you have, uh, you have a lot of HR managers and HR generalists that yeah. do recruiting, um, and you know, they may, you know, we've seen it already with people expressing interest uh, in what we're doing here. So, you know, anybody that touches recruiting, uh, you know, in any way, is going to benefit from the work that we do. Yeah. Right. So, hey, Jeff Zimmer. Roberts. Yeah, go ahead. I wouldn't even say that recruiting, even recruiting assistants that are just maybe getting their feet wet into recruiting resources. I have one here. Um, she's amazing, you know, but she has a lot to learn. Um, I think that's what helps. I think this is what's a great part of this association is that you have practitioners like myself who literally are working every day in the recruiting field as a go-to person. I've been doing that. Levy's been doing that guy forever. I started doing it about uh, maybe a year ago, and now I have like three or four people. I'm having a phone call this afternoon about doing a, 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 a very uh, meticulous search, um, but it has to be very private. So how do I go about doing that? And people will reach out to me, and I'm absolutely positively happy to uh, discuss these things after hours or on weekends. And I do it for free. I mean, it's just, it's, I think it's better to mentor my community um, and make a recruiter better, you know, because it, it's, it, you know, pay it forward. That's, that's my thing. Yeah. One more point on this, and I think it's uh, another critical one, is that uh, you know, the, the truth is, and this is my case, and I believe Derek's and, and many people I know, is that as recruiting professionals, uh, you know, we may cross a variety of paths in our career where you know, we could be corporate, uh, we could be agency, we could be, uh, you know, I'm a consultant and trainer today, so I'm a vendor today. Uh, and I could easily go back and be corporate tomorrow. So, and that's okay. Uh, so, to have just made this for practitioner only, uh, practitioners only would have really left out a lot of people who really, you know, you know, who, who as part of their career, they're in and out of being practitioners. Uh, and they have things. And if they're out, they're not a practitioner today. It doesn't mean that they don't have value or or you know, good inputs to provide through this. And in fact, if anything, maybe we could drive even more innovation, uh, more uh, from the practitioner side into the things that the vendors are doing, which is, I think, another great opportunity by making this inclusive. Absolutely. Um, and I think you kind of answered this, but more specifically, Jess, wants to, Jess Roberts, thanks for being here. Uh, he said, since recruiting and sourcing are so closely aligned, what are the plans for overlapping the functions? And I'll add, like, educating people about the functions. So I think that that gap exists, maybe not in this circle, right? But outside of this circle, people don't understand that there's sourcing, there's recruiting, and some people do both, some people don't. Well, and sure, I mean, sourcing looks different in different organizations. Uh, yeah, and so, but I think that when it comes to, uh, you know, one of the things we don't want to do is replicate anything. 
So we're not you know, looking at say, okay, well, we're going to build something like SourceCon. No, you know, SourceCon's doing great stuff uh, as they are, and we're not looking to replicate uh, you know, other things that are working really, really well in engaging people and delivering content and, and great learning and networking opportunities. Uh, but we, one, thing, one of the things that we do want to do is in building the body of knowledge to better define what sourcing is uh, and how it fits into other parts of recruiting. Uh, what are you know? We're, we're not going to get so granular as to say, well, you know, this is how you create boolean strings. These are standard ways to create boolean strings. That would be kind of ridiculous. But there's other aspects of this where you, I think we can build in some learning. Certainly, ethics, uh, ethical standards when it comes to candidate engagement, uh, is an opportunity on the sourcing side that, that we would, be, as an example, something we might look to address. Uh, and then also, you know, to be able to start to help people understand what the paths are. You know, for some. They love sourcing. They don't want to be anything else but a sourcer, and that's great. Others, you know, sourcing maybe is one of the things that they're doing in, you know, in their career path. And maybe even you know, by default someday they end up as a full cycle recruiter. Or maybe they go to agency, uh, and, they, you know, and maybe they come back and be a, sor a sourcer. But people should start to hopefully through this get an understanding of what the career opportunities are uh, and how things connect. Uh, and uh, I think we could do a really good job to help define that. Cool. So I have a few questions here that all kind of circle around the same thing. And Derek, I'm hoping you can address this. So I have a question from Allison McKay, who runs the Silicon Valley Recruiters Association. She's awesome. Um, the a question from Audra, Audra Knight, uh, runs employer branding, right? From Levy, all asking about other associations: Silicon Valley, HROS, uh, NAPS, and ASA. How do those associations fit into the equation in your, from your perspective? I'd say that they would be, they would be a complementary piece to what we're doing. Um, it gives the smaller uh, groups like a TANS, for example, or the group that Mike Wolfer put together down in Tampa Bay, or the, or, um, the Georgia uh, Coalition. There's, once again, like we were saying, that we're not saying, okay, we'll just abandon the local stuff. I'm not going to abandon Recruit DC. Um, I think it's going to be, they, it gives them a larger voice, and it gives them a seat at our ta at this table where they can come in and say, well, this is what my group is. It's almost like putting the United States together, right? And we're all having an agreement that we're all band together to be a country. But it really is an agreement between states because states have their own rights, they have their own opinions, they have their thoughts of how to do things. It's the same thing with ATAP. ATAP is just going to be more of like that federal body where everybody gets a seat at the table, not people are voted in or anything. But it gives them it gives them a, a larger voice, and they can talk with the groups at TANS, right? Um, they can talk with, with with Atlanta, and they can have a conversation about, hey, let's we're going to do this, or invite maybe somebody from Atlanta to go speak at TANS. I spoke at TANS yeah. once. Um, I've spoken in other places as well. So it's it, it kind of like we all get on the same page. Does that make sense? Yep. I'll, I'll be a little bit. Jump in there, huh? Yeah, and actually, uh, w w um, this is th these conversations have actually are have been happening now for a couple of years. We have, we have we were actually a couple of years starting maybe three years ago, three four years ago, that uh, when I was leading Recruit DC and uh, started talking to the leaders of a number of these other local groups, where we started to have a dialogue. Uh, a few of us even met together at a conference one time and hashed out what actually a network might look like, what would be the benefits, what could we learn from each other, what should we, should we, what should we be sharing. Uh, I, there's tremendous value in these local groups and you know, it, it, they're really critical because they allow anybody to get out in an you know, affordable way, a few hours away from their desk, go out, meet their peers, get exposed to new ideas, learn a thing or two, take it back to the office. Uh, yeah, and so uh, we're, you know, there is general agreement that, uh, amongst the people that were initially part of the conversation. We're going to we're going to broaden this conversation, uh, hopefully soon. That you know we can learn a lot about each other. We should be sharing information about uh, content of events and format, uh, governance, uh, funding, sponsors, maybe even some, like a speakers speakers bureau type of uh, type of thing. Uh, the, because all these groups have really grown up in their own silos, and uh, you know, again collectively. We could potentially learn a lot more from each other, maybe even provide a shared services model. These are all things that we've yeah. already started to think about. And that's just the US. And there's an opportunity potentially to pull in overseas groups too, as there are local groups 
around the world. Uh, and and let me just make real quick. Please, yeah. I think the other thing to think about or look at from a, a local organization is um, having a global organization that you're part of is going to help in your recruiting for people into your own into your own uh, section in, in let's say in Phoenix. We're in Los Angeles or San Diego, where San Diego's Recruiters Roundtable, for example. So it gives you a bigger a bigger voice. Um, we can uh, people like Ben or um, Kathleen Smith or, uh, can help in putting together like what we do here for we rec uh, recruit DC. We actually put on two local conferences. And recruiting in Atlanta versus recruiting in uh, DC versus recruiting in Tampa or recruiting in New York is all totally different markets. You know, the DC market is predominantly a cleared market, so it's a cleared space, so we recruit differently. And then in Tampa, that's a totally different space, right? Atlanta, totally different space. Everything they're doing is a little bit different. It's got a little, but by working together in those different regions, we get to learn from each other how you're doing something, right? Yep. So I see it as a massive positive for any of the organizations, large or small, to actually re retain and increase their membership. Totally. Yeah, so it's a great way to Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. I just, yeah, well, we can go, yeah, we can go to the next one. <laughs> All right. Um, and we have about 10 minutes left, so let's let's zoom through. I know it always goes so fast. Um, so Jason Vogel, thanks for being here. He said, you know, part of the mission of ATAP is to advocate for our profession with government agencies. Can you give me an idea of what that looks like? Well, you know, there's uh, laws and regulations uh, in state houses, uh, Capitol Hill, and regulatory agencies constantly that impact what we do in recruiting. Uh, we need a voice. Uh, you know, we need to uh, be a part of the conversation uh, around the practical implications of these uh, laws and regulations. Uh, and, you know, from our perspective, offer be able to offer our perspective on you know what the best possible solution is. So whether it's uh, like OFCCP regulations, for example, a uh, great example where you know a organization like ATAP really would have been very, I think, would have been very beneficial uh, to be a part of that conversation. Uh, you know, there's other there's you know laws being implemented now uh, or in other state houses around equal pay. Uh, you know, Love the idea. We want to be, you know, we want to see people pay as much as anybody. But how do we actually help craft uh, legislation that that makes sense, that's practical, uh, and that is going to achieve the desired results? Uh, and so, yeah, there's. I think there's. A, those are just a couple of the uh, the examples. But we were created. We 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 are a five hundred one c six, so we can lobby, uh, and we we absolutely intend to be able to do that. Derek, a quick history lesson. Title seven, which HR knows well was first implemented to government contractors, yeah. which is one-third of the workforce in the United States. Most people don't know that. These are at real numbers. It was signed into law after they figured out they, how to make it work by government contractors, because government contractors really have no voice. If they try to speak out, it's like, well, get out of your contract. You can't really do that to, not, to just commercial entities that don't do any work with the government. So that's what's happening now, folks. And right now, we don't have a seat at the table. Not, not, not one. Every person that's putting this through an LFCCP or a bunch of attorneys, they never recruited in their lives before. Half of them aren't even really in an HR position. They're just looking at everything from a legal standpoint. Eventually, this is going to hit Congress. It just is. It's a train wreck waiting to happen. So if you want, that's the biggest thing that I, that I saw from, from this was that we have a really loud and large voice as a community. And we say this is something that we, either if you're going to do it, let's do it right. Yeah. You know what I mean? Let's us, let us put our practitioners up to the bench and up to the plate and show you why this is going to make sense and why this isn't going to make sense. Because right now we got zero voice right now. Totally. Now I'm going to slightly interrupt the conversation because I found this awesome recruiting blogs t-shirt yesterday. It says badass blogger on the back. Um, and if you are an extra large and you want this shirt, first person to send me their address gets the shirt. I will mail it to you today. Okay, next question. <laughs> um, all right, so great question from Jacob. You mentioned international influence. Um, a lot of the organizations that exist today are very U.S. centric. How do you plan on integrating the international voice uh, hey, Jacob. association? 
Uh, so, you know, great question, Jacob. And I think sort of part, that's actually going you know, to potentially start with our board, the board we're putting together. Actually, just talking to Derek a little bit about that earlier. I think that having international presence on the board and on uh, throughout our committees is going to be key. Uh, also, tapping into existing organizations uh, and affiliating with them uh, will also be important. And and actually, you know, one of the things we, when we first started talking about this, the core group that we had, scalability. Of this is obviously going to be an issue and a challenge. And uh, you know, it was actually Daniel Monahan, recruiting leader out at Amazon, who has a global team, who absolutely insisted that you know we need this to be global. That you know, my this is not good for my. This is not going to help my team if it's just U.S. Uh, and there are many, many other leaders like her. And so we are hoping that the Daniels of the world and the others that have global recruiting teams will really step up and want to be a part of this too, because certainly I know, I, I just know, I know from my experience working for Marriott, for example, a global company, and doing the consulting I do, when we dip into new markets, it can often be a pretty significant learning curve uh, as to customs, regulations, and laws, uh, and just you know, general recruiting practices in different parts of the world. Uh, so I think that, you know, as part of building the body of knowledge, uh, it is likely that we could also build this kind of global body of knowledge and that and account for cultural differences uh, and other global differences within that body of knowledge as well and be a place for people to go to because right now how do you learn about those sort of things well either you, right. you ask a lawyer or you google it yeah. Yeah? that's not good enough we need to do better <laughs> which <laughs> we all know <laughs> If you look at the recruiting in Australia, like when I was down in Australia speaking, the, their privacy laws are frightening. I mean, half yeah. the tools that a sorcerer or a recruiter is using in their Google ribbon right now, you can't use in Australia or New Zealand. Um, the European yeah. Union, it's commonplace to have a photo on a resume. And actually, you can be turned down for a job, especially in the services industry, if you're not attractive. Same thing for the airline industry. Um, they, they're all pretty people. And you, if you're not pretty enough on the resume, they're just not going to call you. That's completely taboo in the United States. Um, you know, just even immigration systems. When you look at Germany's immigration system, it's ridiculous to go through to get a non a non German citizen a job in, in Germany is really rough. I mean, it can be done, but it's a lot of paperwork. So I mean, I've, I've done a lot of global recruiting, and I've seen a lot of things. And I totally agree with Ben. It's like somebody that has that knowledge is, is very far and few between, and we can help each other kind of traverse those waters as well. Totally. All right, so we have three minutes left. Time always flies when you're having fun. I'm going to send, actually, I'm going to send these to all of your questions during this that we didn't get a chance to answer so they can address you specifically. Absolutely. Awesome. I was just going to say, they're both awesome like that. They will go out of their way to help. I think that's, that's why this is so great is because I know that a lot of the leadership team for this organization, they're people who would go out of their way to help anytime. So to have you guys at scale running a big thing, I think, is really helpful in our community. So thank you both for investing those late nights and your time. Absolutely. Um, the question I've gotten probably four times now is, how do we get involved? So uh, let's drop oh, the URL. That is so easy. You know, that's what so they easy. And what you guys yeah. need help with. Oh, OK. Well, for, first and foremost, uh, go to atabglobal. Org, if you have not done so already, it's our landing page. We're still building the infrastructure of this, and we will continue to do so through the end of the year, along with our, uh, selecting a board. So that's really our focus right now, and then looking at a, a broader, more official launch in early 2017. So on the ATAP Global site now, you, if you haven't done so already, please go there and uh, express uh, interest in membership. Quick little easy form you can complete. And if you are also interested in potentially being a member of our board, uh, up until the end of October, we also uh, are, uh, have the ability, you have the ability to self-nominate yourself for the board as well. Uh, and so to date, uh, we've, been we've been up now for about three and a half weeks, a little over three weeks. We've had over 700 people complete nomination form, or excuse me, complete membership interest forms, and over 100 people now uh, express interest in, uh, in being a part of the board. Uh, it's, and we're, we just, you know, we have more uh, opportunities to get the word out, but for, uh, for anybody who's interested in how they might get involved, this is a place to get started. Uh, and then once we get closer to launch, then we're going to be likely forming committees, uh, and, uh, you know, you need to be a member to be a part of a committee, and so there will be more and more opportunities, uh, many, many opportunities to get involved at that point. Uh, and if we need other volunteers along the way, we'll put the word out. 
uh, to the people that have expressed interest, and uh, we'll uh, get you engaged as well. And you don't need 20 years experience, by the way, guys. I'm serious. I'm, serious. I'm being 100% serious. Um, the board is going to be a mixture of the United States and European, Canadian, Australian. Um, it's going to be, we, we're, we're definitely looking at this as a global area, and you don't need 20 years experience to even be on the board. So if you're somebody that just thinks like, oh, well, I've only been in this business like four or five, six years, you still got a voice. We still want to hear from you. If you don't get on the board, you, we're going to get, maybe you get on a committee. Work yourself towards the board. Uh, the board's it's not going to be the same board. It's going to change what every two years, Ben. Uh, we'll we'll have people, people switching in and out every year, actually. Uh, well, right. okay. yeah, yeah, two-year term, but uh, seats will rotate uh, over a two-year term. Cool. So cool. there's always uh, there's always advancement opportunity. So. Yeah, and what's the Twitter handle in case people are on Twitter and want to follow or tweet about the organization? Uh, ATAP Global. All keep right. It Very cool. <laughs> Well, that's our time. Um, a lot of people are saying this is not enough time to talk about this recruiting association. So we'll have to have you guys back on uh, as you're building out the board and really building out the uh, services. Thank you both so much for your time. The recording of this will be live on the Recruiting Daily page uh, by the end of the day. Um, and like I said, if anybody has questions, find Ben, find Derek. Uh, and here's a sneak, a little side note too on the t-shirts. I'm going to export that list, and I'm going to make Noel, our CEO, who is on the line, too, send all of you shirts. So you all get your shirts soon. All right, guys. <laughs> That's nice. Hey, right. you're going to have a little fun with this, right? All right, guys. We will see you next week when we have Jennifer Newbill. She is the head of engagement at Dell, uh, engagement recruiting at Dell, which is a really interesting subject. Um, so, yeah, we'll see you all next week. Bye, guys. Thank you, thank you. See you. Thanks for having us. Oh.